This podcast is brought to you by the North Dakota Petroleum Foundation. From heating our homes and powering our vehicles to cell phones, clothing, and medical equipment, oil and natural gas makes everyday life better. North Dakota Oil and Natural Gas, advancing the possibilities. Learn more at ndpetroleumfoundation.org. Welcome to Plain Talk Live. Well, Derek Chauvin has been convicted. Uh, What does that mean now going forward? Is the debate over uh, law enforcement reform? Is the debate over criminal justice reform? Is it over? Well, not by any stretch of the imagination, but it is nice to see the cynics proved wrong. Uh, We had a a trial. uh, We had a conviction. I think it was, I did preface it. You're going to hear me be Um, A little bit critical when I I joined my co-host Jonah Lanto, you're going to hear me be a little bit critical of uh, of of not the trial process itself, but maybe some of the political environment, the social environment around the trial. But I want to be clear. I thought it was the right outcome. Uh, Derek Derek Chauvin deserved to get convicted. We all watched what happened. And uh, he's he's probably going to appeal. I don't see any chance that the appeal. Well, I don't want to say any chance, but it seems unlikely that the appeals are going to be successful at this point. Um, but where do we go from here? Joining me to talk about that is uh, Jonah Lanto, who has some interesting news, by the way. I'm holding in my hot little hands a press release for uh, Jonah's. Uh, Jonah's a podcast. Uh, I I think I described him in the introduction to this show as a podcast entrepreneur. Uh, Pod, I, you know, I'm a podcaster, a content creator, writer, producer. I wear go. many hats. All right. it, it all began with podcasting. All began with uh, with podcasting. Um, he has a uh, right now kind of a kind of a barn burner show that you guys have out right now. True crime. It's so popular right now. And by the way, I'm into it. True crime. Uh, criminal defense being a little bit my family's business. Uh, if people know my background, I worked for years as a private investigator. My da- dad was a homicide investigator in the state of Alaska. So I've, I've worked on that. My sister works in public defense. Um, I'm, I'm into this stuff. I love it. Uh, Jonah and his co-host Don Palumbo have a, a podcast. It's called Midwest murder, um, which you can find on all of whatever your favorite podcasting services that you like to use. And they're actually taking it on the road. Um, I think the first event is here in Minot, April 22nd at off the vine, uh, let's see, Wednesday, April 28th at Fat Fish Brewing in Dickinson, Thursday, April 29th, you're at the Speakeasy in Bismarck, Friday, April 30th, DCR Brewing in, uh, DCR Brewing Company in Fargo, Saturday, May 1st, Fergus Brewing Company in Fergus Falls, uh, Sunday, May 2nd, Rhombus Guys Brewing Company in Grand Forks. Tell us a little bit, how, how do people find tickets and all that fun stuff? Dang, that's a tour. Rob, I appreciate the shout out and recognition. Midwest Murder, of course, can be found anywhere podcasts can be downloaded. And it's really well-researched, thrilling storytelling and uh, true crime drama. We are creating a great atmosphere. I think storytelling is something that we all appreciate. People have a pretty insatiable hunger for true crime, for better or worse. We want to hear those frightful stories. And that's what Don Palumbo and I are bringing to these venues. These are intimate venues. You get to share in the experience with a few dozen other people uh, and have, have a few drinks, sit back, relax, and enjoy almost like dinner theater. But in this case, instead of the theater, it's Don and I telling a very bone chilling story of murder we're really excited about it and i'm happy to bring it to all the other cities in north dakota it's awesome yeah, I, it's I, it's it's almost a family pastime for us like i said my dad was a homicide investigator one of his biggest cases was the robert hansen serial killer in the state of alaska who who killed God, dozens of of women um terrible terrible story but the way he tells it is so engaging and it's so and he was he was right uh, right in it fun fact uh they made a movie about robert hansen it was called on frozen ground starred vanessa hudgens nicholas cage john cusack as the as robert hansen the serial killer nicholas cage played a composite character one of whom represented my father so i can always say <laughs> my father was played by john uh, nicholas cage in a uh, in a movie kind of sort of uh all right so we're gonna move on That's awesome derek uh, derek chauvin trial verdict what'd you think i think it's a moment for us to breathe and accept that this was justice but there's a lot more work to do the right verdict was arrived at 
I, I, what I want to talk about real quick, Rob, and because some of the conflicting feelings that other people I know have about this are, well, the prosecution has experts who say one thing, the defense has experts who say another. And when it comes to a layman, a civilian like myself, what expert am I supposed to believe? I saw the video as you did. I firmly believe Chauvin is guilty of murder. I, I justice was served here and it's the hopefully the first step of many, but it's a moment that we can take comfort in knowing that justice was delivered. But but first and foremost, when we're looking at these big cases, you've got experts on both sides saying, op, detailing opposite observations of the same event. And, and so where do we as citizens, how do we understand what expert to believe? What are your thoughts on the experts? Well, I, I think it's always tough. I mean, maybe people and, – and again, true crime is booming, so I, I think there's probably more awareness of, of how all this works in the general public um, than usual. And, you know, the, the problem is is that everybody's really – both the defense and the prosecution are groping around in the dark because when it comes – to any given situation, and and the the, the George Floyd is, is a bad example because it happened right out in public. There was video of it, um, but a lot of times, if somebody gets murdered, there aren't a lot of witnesses to it, right? And it's kind of the Very accused, rarely. the accused. Uh, most of the, the victim, obviously, if you're talking about a murder case, is dead. Um, if if it's if it's like an assault or a rape or something, I mean, they're alive. But then it's well, they're saying one thing, they're saying another thing, and and that really comes down to. Defense. I mean, the defense is not going to put on an expert that is going to do anything but support the defense's case. I mean, if they should, they should. If they do, they should be disbarred and, and not, you know, representative. It's it's a tough thing to watch, and and probably is. And again, as somebody who has worked in, in admittedly in a very very minor minor support role, but but has seen the process up close, you know, criminal defense is hugely important, and a big part of their job is to go through. And find the places where the state messed up. Because you know what? If the state messes up and there's a technicality and there's a reasonable doubt, then the person deserves to be acquitted. That's the way the process is set to, is set up to work. And that's the way it should work. And that was one thing heading in. I've obviously felt a lot better after I watched the trial unfold. But one thing I was really worried in about with the Derek Chauvin trial was that the defense was going to come in and they were going to find something legitimate. Um, evidence that had been mishandled or something. And again, this is a, it's a tough case to use as an right. example because it happened and, right and, now. And, and nothing legitimate was found. And again, I want yeah. just I was just curious your your again your your thoughts on opposing expert testimonies. I know it's the process, but when people are watching this, people who believe Chauvin was guilty, people who want him to be, to be guilty, and they see these again experts and, and they're like, well, man, now I don't know. I'm a little confused. Was it the, was it, was it drugs? Was it, was it, was it the combination of all these things? I believe Chauvin was guilty, but maybe yeah. it wasn't of murder. I mean, there, so there's, there, there's just, there's that, there's that little shred of doubt that's being peppered in there because well, of these which opposing is exactly, experts. And, which, which is exactly it, the defense's job. And I, it is. And, and, and so I'm not buying it. I don't believe most people yeah. are buying it, but time and again, it's the confusing, um, process of justice when I uh, we're, 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 we're looking for different outcomes and I can find a dozen experts that agree with my outcome and you can find a dozen experts that agree with yours. And who knows, uh, some of these experts, let's be real, they're opportunistic. Yeah. This is a big name for you to put your to put your name on this trial and to say that you, you drew a line on one side or the other. So of course they could find experts that were yeah. going to suggest these, these other, odd, make these audacious claims that it was it's anything other other than the, the knee of Chauvin who killed George Floyd. If, if, if George Floyd never encounters Derek Chauvin, he's still alive today. He wasn't going to die of a heart attack sitting there from, from any usage of drugs or alcohol going into that event. The, the notion to me is ridiculous. But again, they, they, we, we have experts and we're led to believe, well, they've got research. They've got years of and it's, dedication. Well, and it's, they, it's tough because it's not, I mean, uh, when you're talking about something as complex as a person's health situation, as we saw, as, as we've debated fatality rates from COVID-19. Uh, okay. So you have a lot of comorbidities. It's, George Floyd had comorbidities. He had things in his system that, that could have contributed to his death. He had pre-existing health conditions that could have, but those things can contribute to his death and that death still be precipitated by the fact that there was an officer kneeling on his neck for so, 10 minutes for 10 exactly. minutes. So, so 
it's complex and it's hard. And you're right. I mean, a lot of times defense defense um, expert witnesses can be some pretty skeezy people willing to just say whatever the defense pays them to say. On the other hand, you have prosecutors who are not talking about the, the Chauvin case specifically, but you have prosecutors who can use uh, jailhouse snitches as a notorious example oh, yeah. of, a, of, Jail, a, of a there, witness. There's been a callback to Midwest murder in both of these, and, the, and it's why it's so studying murder, reading jury transcripts, we can watch it, but reading investigation files, reading jury transcripts, there's always two things, right? There's when somebody murders somebody, there's almost always a jailhouse confession. And let me tell you, if you're, if you're anybody out there's a would be criminal, don't go tell anybody about it when you go behind yeah. bars, because I promise don't, you, they're going to use that. When you're against behind you. bars, the only <laughs> person who's your friend yeah. is your lawyer, is your lawyer. That's, That's it. it. The it, cops it's, aren't it's, your friend. So, you're, in you're, every you're... murder case that I've almost every murder case that I've done on Midwest murder, we have a jailhouse confession. Yeah. And again, and concurrently, there's there's oftentimes a, a quote unquote expert witness who is brought in who s- says something that is in opposition to Who's, what the prosecution. Well, there was a famous there was a famous serial killer out of Texas who for a while. Uh, uh, there's a documentary about him. Now I'm forgetting his name. There's a documentary about him on, on Netflix. It's, he was the confession killer, right? Because the cops could get him to confess to anything. And he had, by the time he was done, he had confessed to like 300 murders or something. I mean, it was just, it was crazy because every cop in the country with an open murder on their file Let's could, uh, could come and pin it on this guy. I remember vaguely, I remember vaguely and, hearing and, about uh, that. So. so, I mean, you have stuff like that, um, you know, bite well, bite marks, for instance, you know, very famously in the Ted Bundy case, there was a, a famous uh, bite mark expert, right? And that was kind of the first time it had been used. But if you, if you go back, if you go into more modern cases, I mean, they've been able to demonstrate that these quote-unquote bite mark experts couldn't even distinguish between a human bite mark and an animal bite mark. Yeah. So yeah. this is I mean, we're, we're wading into a crevasse here and, and it's, it's it's we we are let's cycle cycle back to the the, the did, verdict and 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 where we go right. from here. I, I definitely I, th- I felt like we had to talk about the experts for people sure. but what 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 happens now? Where do we go from here because uh, and you've got a lot of uh, a lot of people upset over Another killing yesterday, a 16-year-old teenager yeah. looked to be allegedly assaulting a, another young lady with a knife, and an officer had to make a really, really difficult decision, and and now people are very up in arms over that. Right on the heels, within hours of a, of a Chauvin guilty verdict, we, we have another unfortunate tragedy and another terrible loss of life and questions as to whether or not was it necessary, was the right force used, and and and. And man, I don't know. I don't want to get into the weeds on that one because we're here to talk about Chauvin and justice reform and accountability and what that looks like well, now. We're here, but we're here but to it's talk like we can't about, get away from it. But, but we are here to talk about what comes next. And cases like that yeah. show the fundamental problem. And he, he, here's the thing. And this is what worried me a little bit about the Chauvin trial is, and I, I think it's probably going to be a basis for his appeal and the fact that we got a verdict so quickly after the trial concluded it may help and again i don't i don't think his his uh his appeals are going to be successful nor based on all the information available to us right now do i think they should be uh yeah. but one one thing that that is troubling is when you have such an aggressive political movement around it where when an officer is accused of doing something like this and then you have a very aggressive political movement that has concluded that that officer is absolutely guilty but you're also trying to hold a trial where the, the guilt or innocence is going to be decided by members of the public, um, which, by the way, that always bothers me when cops, because a lot of times when I'm I'm critical of law enforcement, I'll hear cops say, well, you've never worn a badge. How can you be judged? Look at who judges these cases where cops are on trial. It's people without badges. As a matter of fact, I'm pretty sure if, if you were a cop or you're related to in a the cop rare or something, instance they stand trial. Yes, in the rare instance they are. You know, actually it, brought to that's who you're ultimately judged for. So everybody gets to weigh in on this stuff. But that's yep. kind of the part that bothers me. If you're in that jury room, and let's say, and again, I didn't see it in the Chauvin trial, but let's say in another one, there's there's reasonable doubt, right? There, there's reasonable doubt. You have a reason to believe that maybe they didn't do it. Maybe you know, prosecution didn't meet. How do you deal with the mob that's outside of the courthouse that is ready to burn things down if you don't get if you don't render the verdict that they've already decided is the just one? You 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 don't. 
it's it's the, the the mob will be the mob it always has been the mob that that's we we've shown that our society has shown that time and again i think the, the a, a deeper problem and this this cuts both ways that we face and i know you're familiar with this cuz you don't appreciate the process when when the when alleged criminals are put out there uh, they become they become guilty first. We 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 justice is supposed to be innocent until proven guilty. But as time goes on, and I watch uh, social media and the internet and and everything interact with the progress of justice, I'm seeing a lot of cases where people are guilty until proven innocent in the eyes of the public. And perhaps that isn't new, but it, it, it's certainly under a magnifying glass now in the social media era. And I see it happen on the local level with small time criminals. And 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 we see it obviously in a, in a, in a much larger example in big cases like this. You know, just, just last year, I wrote, an, I wrote a column about a gentleman in... Um Castleton, just outside of Fargo. Um, I think it was the Cass County Sheriff's Department that handled the case. And what what happened is, is this, this gentleman and his family were coming home. They lived in a trailer park. They drove by his neighbor, um, his neighbor who was was according to police reports very intoxicated. Uh, came over, was upset, said that that uh, the defendant's truck was too loud. Um, and I'm forgetting the guy's name now. But he came up and and and. They got into a physical altercation. The neighbor had his hands around the guy's neck. The guy was pinned up against his truck, feared for his life. Turned out he was a concealed carry holder, pulled his gun, shot the guy. The guy died. Um, he was arrested. His mugshot was widely posted um, in the news, local news media, including the company I work for. But ultimately, he wasn't charged with a crime because prosecutors decided that he had exercised. He acted in self-defense. He acted in self-defense, wow. and they didn't feel like they could. But here's the thing, is that guy has to live the rest of his life, any future job, professional acquaintance, personal acquaintance that he has, anybody Googling his name is probably going to come up with that mugshot. In fact, we had a debate about it in the legislature this year. There was a bill to ban the display of mugshots of people who haven't yet been adjudicated as guilty. And there were some exceptions to it. You know, if somebody um, was fleeing from law enforcement and you needed to use their mugshot to uh, th things like that, or, or, or I you can, could, you I could, can see a few reasonable, uh, uh, right. reasonable uh, yeah, objections to that. Or, or if they'd been previously convicted, you could use that mugshot, things sure. like that. Um, but, you know, essentially saying, you know, this is something because it, it pre it's prejudicial. Um, it's prejudicial because oh, it's you, very, very, you know, and, but, but that gets back to the Derek Chauvin thing. How do you have, and again, I do think he had a fair trial. I'm just very, very worried about, you know, one thing, it, it's just amazing. I was watching, uh, or not watching CNN, but I, I saw a tweet from a CNN reporter and I, I retweeted this cause it, it bugged me, but the CNN reporter was like, Oh, Derek Chauvin's defense attorney and his closing arguments was, was focusing on reasonable doubt and not talking about Derek Chauvin's innocence that's very telling and it's it's like how did you get to be a senior legal analyst when you don't know that it the burden of proof for innocence is not on the defense of course he's talking about reasonable doubt that's his only job that's what he's got that's that's that's, that's what, all that's he what has got to do. at that point that's all he yeah. has to do once he has that he doesn't have to he doesn't have to prove Derek Chauvin innocent it's pretty uh, it's it's a it's very common in clo defense attorneys closing arguments if you're if you're if that's the case that you have right if that's if that's the case that you are making in your defense case it's not unusual so wh where where do we go from here rob is this a place where uh, I, I know you and i had a chat yesterday about what what could happen next and i think something that that comes up time and again are in situations like Derek Chauvin um, and, and what he did, and so many of these cops, what a lot of citizens are seeing out there is is there's a there's a strong feeling in many many segments of American culture that police are acting more harshly against minorities that that you know the way that yeah. black people are being arrested the way that minorities are being arrested is is handled much more dangerously and with much greater force than when white people are arrested now i i see that evidence as to, as being true there there is enough out there where i've seen uh, you know, I, I saw cops let a guy walk all the way down the street for for a, a whole city block with a knife. They didn't shoot him. Uh, concurrently, you know, we we've seen people that that 
got strangled to death over selling cigarettes. So, you know, we, we have this combination of like mass shooters getting easily arrested, right? Uh, and then people who have committed very, very minor infractions, right? A lot of these times we're seeing these minorities being being arrested in the escalation to violence. It, it, it seems great or significant in so many situations when the law being broken is simple. It's, it's, it's so many of these are minor crimes that are being responded to with extreme prejudice is what is, is, is what it really seems like to me. You know, your, so, your, your, your comments are kind of in jiving with uh, a comment that we have from the chat room. And by the way, if you're watching this, uh, if you're watching this on one of our news sites in forum.com, Grand Forks Herald, Dot com Jamestown Sun. There's a live chat room you can participate in and ask us questions as we go. Joe Toyota asks, why is negative interaction between blacks and the police so predominant? Why do we hear very little of negative outcomes with police, with the Asian, wh Indian, white, Hispanic, or any other race? The blacks seem to have this century-old chip on their shoulder that they better get control of. Now, I, I don't agree with that last part, but I think I think... Part of what you're talking about is, and, and this is what you and I were talking about a little bit yesterday. And and I, my theory, and it, it's not—I shouldn't say it's my theory. It's 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 something that I've read in a lot of places, and I believe it's true. And and we should also be careful because in in a situation as complex as this, there's no there's no like one grand unifying explanation for everything. There's a lot of of overlapping explanations that can all simultaneously be true. But this one, I I think that we have an overall problem with law enforcement with law enforcement that has grown too militant law enforcement that sees itself as set apart from the rest of society um that is a is too quick to use violence to solve problems because they have a militant very military um idea now and, and the reason why that hammer falls and i don't think it's just the blacks the commenter's wrong ask native americans they have a long history with problems mm -hmm. with with law enforcement, it's just that Native American communities tend to be very small communities um, due to, I mean, the, the very fact that they were put on the reservations where they live today is, you know, so that they would be out of sight, out of mind. So maybe we don't see it as much in the news media because, unfortunately, we don't cover those communities like we should. But Native Americans have a very large problem with law enforcement as well. So it's not just black people by any stretch of the imagination. And but I, I think the reason why the problem, the, the the hammer hit so hard on minority communities like our black friends and neighbors is because their communities are the ones that get the most attention from law enforcement due to the fact that because of social and economic issues, because of historical racism, you know, they're they're te those tend to be high crime. They get a lot of attention from police for for reasons that are i think both obvious and probably too numerous to list here so that's where they get a lot of police attention but i i think police we have a problem with with overbearing police no matter what community you're talking about yeah and we and we talk we talk a little bit i consider the idea a lot like how many bad employees exist within an within any given company right and, and i don't i don't have any data on what that number is but if you just think take any but take amazon take take your local grocery store take where you work there might be there might be guys or girls that work you like man they're kind of a kind of a lackluster employee right they have a real problem with management they treat the customers like crap all of this stuff and and that happens within it within every industry Policing is an industry, and within that industry, there are unquestionably bad employees. And a bad employee that is given the power that our police have is terrifying, and we're seeing the repercussions of that. And and I, 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 does that have to do with is the barrier to become a police too low? Are the background checks not excessive enough? Are we not evaluating the demeanor of of a you know the the psychological demeanor are of somebody before they come police? Are we paying them enough? Are we asking them to do jobs that perhaps aren't suitable for uh, a, a, a militarized are, 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 police are force? We putting the, are we putting them in positions where they are forced to they, – they are put in a position to, to enforce silly laws 
that erode their relationship with the larger community. Yes. I don't know if you yes, remember. That, I don't I, that right. No, yes, that right there. That is a big one. Is the num- the number of silly laws that are eroding trust in the police system and in our government itself. A lot of that can stem back to the drug war too. Is it's a whole other problem altogether. I, well, what, but I, even, I just I even, wanted to bring no, out a number here sure. ma- from mappingpoliceviolence.org. Most of the killing, the majority of killings begin with traffic stops, mental health checks, domestic disturbances, or report, reported low-level offenses. So it's it, it's so many of these killings aren't starting with well, this is a bank robbery or this is a carjacking or or you know this is uh, some some great disturbing level of of violence and terror is happening. We need to respond to this and get this bad guy. These are not the calls that are going in that are resulting in the death of our fellow Americans. In, in, in 2020, there were 120 killings that began as traffic stops. Yeah. So, so to, to build on that, if you remember um, the, uh, the unrest that we saw around Ferguson, Missouri, right? After, after a lot of that had cooled down, the Department of Justice had gone in and they had done an investigation and if you if you looked and I don't know if it got as much of attention because obviously when these reports come out it's long after maybe the the uh, the unrest isn't happening anymore it's not making headlines anymore but one of the conclusions was in that community in Ferguson you know local local officials had made the decision to generate revenue with traffic citations and where were oh, they doing the most of it in the minority community so now you have cops who are down there writing jaywalking tickets and writing, uh, you know, parking tickets and, you know, little ticky tacky speeding tickets and to the point where it just, it creates this low simmering feeling of resentment. We ask our cops to do a lot of things. It was one of the reasons when we were having the big debate about masks, which I am 100% pro mask. I, I thought people should be wearing their masks during the, uh, during the pandemic, I mean, obviously, I had my near-death experience with COVID. I, I believe in it. But one, w- when we were debating, like, like a mask mandate, what always went to my mind was enforcement. And who are we going to ask to start enforcing things? Well, enforcing that's going to fall on the cops, yeah. right? I mean, you know, when it, something as trivial as, uh, you know, are, 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 you, are you enough feet away from the entrance of a public building here in North Dakota uh, in order to... Um, uh, smoke a in cigarette. order to smoke a cigarette. Well, who enforces that? Well, the cops do, right? So I've never seen it enforced. It, I've ever. never, I've never either. But they have so many things that they're stuck enforcing. And what does that do? It makes us. We have too many laws on the books, which is probably a topic for a whole nother show. Um, but that's, I mean, that's. I think that's very, very important. What exactly are we asking our cops to do? Because on on the other side of it, uh, uh, Jason just asked in the chat room. At the end of the day, citizens need to be protected. Why was Floyd out of jail in the first place? And I'm I'm not really I, I don't know. He was out of jail. Uh, I I know I know he had some sort of a criminal background. I'm assuming he was out of jail because he was supposed to be out of jail. But at, but I, I think a lot of people feel that way. Cops need to be able to do their jobs too, and I agree with that. And they have a lot of scrutiny. And I there's a lot of people I'm sure who are thinking about going into law enforcement, who are thinking right now. Oh my God! If I make one mistake, I'm gonna end up I'm gonna end up in headlines across the country, and my whole life's gonna be ruined, and I'm gonna get convicted of a crime, whether I actually did it or not. There's a they're, lot of cops right now who are probably feeling very, very scared. I I, I don't blame them, uh, Rob. Having having a difficult job, being challenged in your job, feeling pressure or stressed from your job. It just it just doesn't grant you the privilege of killing an American citizen on on for trivial reasons. I don't and and I under I respect the pressure that our police force is under. What I what I what I'm what I'm struggling with is is again is the lack of accountability. And I'm yeah. going to reference mappingpoliceviolence.org. Ninety eight point three percent of killings by police from 2013 to 2020 have not resulted in officers being charged with a crime. I just don't. But the, the problem is that's a, a that's a broad category, though. I mean, how? I mean, it, let's let's face it. We give cops guns for a reason because sometimes it is, it is a broad category. It, sometimes it, it they're justified category. in using them. But the uh, again, we're not. We're and I'm not saying oh, every cop needs to be punished, but but. The, through police unions, you know, you can get kicked out of kicked out of a department in in, in one unit, 
the contracts reset because you've got a, you've got a great contract and a bad cop who got fired for being a bad cop can become a cop again somewhere depending on uh you know what that violation was but the the facts are like Chauvin's history himself like this is not a guy this is not the first time he's had a pretty negative interaction with the public that he's there to serve the the, the writing is on the wall with so with so many of these officer these 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 events in which an officer kills one of our citizens the there was a precursor to that these are so many of these it's so usually not their people. first rodeo i mean there's usually it's, other it's, problems it's, in that personnel file why why are these man how many it's 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 like how many times can you do you get written up before you're not allowed to be police anymore and right now it just it seems like it's it's too many we're we're allowing too many and there's not and again i think the, another problem is depending on what district you serve what role of law enforcement what state you're in we don't have uniformity and i and i respect local jurisdictional I- instructions but now police are being uh, viewed and, and held accountable in the public's eye on a national scale and and not every police department is necessarily playing with the same set of rules with the same with the same uniform training in how you handle violence or how you handle escalation or de-escalation. We don't, uh, you know, you, you don't you don't have this this one uniform gold standard way of doing it. And and and, 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 that's, and, that's, and that's and that's tough to do anyway because listen, it, it, being, it, it being a being a the patrol problem. officer in Los Angeles is a much different thing than being a deputy in Pembina County, North Dakota. Way different. Those are very different jobs. So and how, how do we? How do we, you know, how do we uh, reconcile that, and and how do we get to a place? And the uh, fact that again, there's an upper limit on on what taxpayers are willing to pay for law enforcement too. I mean, how we many times? About- how many times as a cop do you get to have a complaint filed against you before you should be fired? Yeah, I've well, been it a depends on the before. type of complaint too. I, of course it does. It, and we it's also have to remember that not, not but it, a lot of times man. members of the public lie too, and they file frivolous complaints that are just because the cop wrote them a, a parking ticket they didn't like, so they're going to make some crap up. That happens too. Um, I mean, cops are are just, and again, I grew up with it. I mean, I grew up with a cop. My dad was a cop, so I mean, I've I've seen that side of it too, and it's it's hard. I think there's a lot of good cops out there who are good people who aren't interested in just trying to shoot somebody. Um, I'd like to believe there are mostly good cops. I yeah, believe there are. I, I think there I don't are believe mostly it's just good a cops. lot. I believe there are mostly good cops. And and when you if you look at the numbers, just mathematically, the statistics show us there are mostly good cops. But the good cops just don't seem like they're holding the bad cops accountable. The good cops seem like the they're thin, covering the thin up blue for the bad line cops. Thing, the, it, the and, and it's, it's, it's a problem. I'm sorry. It's a problem. And, and the thing is, nobody wants to be a narc. Whether you're a criminal or a cop, no matter what side you're on, you don't want to be a narc. If you watch your 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 partner or a or a, or a, 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 a veteran officer, there's numerous examples of a young cop seeing a veteran officer do something he thought was shady, try to report it. He's blackballed. Some of these situations have resulted in really negative consequences for these young officers who tried to speak up the, those, so w- w- there, there is there is a culture of protecting yeah. bad cops well and there's there's there also is. there's also a culture of thinking we're at war now i i actually have an excerpt i i not long ago oh, i wrote segue. I, I wrote a i wrote a column about it's why we get paid the the big or the medium-sized dollars jonah <laughs> um Above not long average ag- at least yeah. not yeah hopefully uh not long ago i had a uh, i wrote a column about uh the grand forks police department and they're giving out some awards to a couple of officers one of cody holt who uh obviously made regional headlines when he uh was was killed in in the line of duty uh and, and another officer who was also injured in in the line of duty and they got Purple Heart medals and the Medal of Honor. And I, I objected to that because those are obviously very famous military honors, right? Those are those are things soldiers get. I, That's I wasn't aware we gave war medals to police. Well, and, I don't, and and that I don't was, know. I'm not that sure how my, that makes me feel. That was my criticism is that we should not give war medals. So call them something different. Like I don't have a problem with with get, with honoring officers who deserve it. Obviously, I think that's a good thing. Um, but don't call them it because it, 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 it contributes to the feeling that they're in the military. Now, in response to this, I got a, I got an email from uh, police uh, are not military. They're, I'm sorry, they're not trained like military yeah, on no, any exactly. on any level. The they're training not is so I meant drastically the, different. And they're not military. We well, can't treat them that way. Well, it should be different. A lot of times it isn't different if you look at the actual training that they get. But I got a, I got a response to that from a, a, a lieutenant, longtime lieutenant, former lieutenant. 
in the uh, Grand Forks Police Department. And the reason why I'm identifying him is because he didn't just email me. He also emailed a version of his comments to me. Uh, he sent them as a letter to the editor of the Grand Forks Herald, and they were published publicly. Uh, so I can actually share you know, some of what he wrote and uh, put it on your screens here. Uh, but what he said is, um, he's responding to me. He says, Port is blurred in his vision as to cops control patrol our communities to promote public safety. Soldiers attack enemies. And this is what, what former Lieutenant Schiller wrote. He said, the streets where cops work is exactly the territory where the enemy resides. Police officers actively promote community public safety 24-7, 365. However, during that time, evil and horrific things will occur, and the police are expected to professionally mitigate these threats under tremendous scrutiny, even at the cost of their own life, like Grand Forks Police Department officer Holt that did that fateful day last year. Port wrote, quote, Our nation has endured no small amount of pain and heartache thanks to the cops who see themselves as military. Rest assured, and this is Schiller again, rest assured, we are at war, and the police officer is the soldier and a warrior who will always answer the call. Um, he says he's a retired Grand Forks Police Department lieutenant in 21 years. He has seen his ample share of human evils and demonic horrors to which Port cannot begin to imagine, all occurring within these city limits. This is the battlefield, he writes. They are the soldiers and the warriors. And then he goes on to say, unless you're willing to badge up, you know, you should just be quiet about this stuff. And... Uh, I, I got to tell you, I mean, that's that's an attitude from a law so enforcement. So if you if you don't official. have or wear a badge, you can't have an opinion on what how law enforcement engages with civilian society. Well, that which is which is baloney. Because by the way, if if that, uh, that's what he's suggesting at the end, that's the, absurd, the ultimate okay. the ultimate accountability for a law enforcement officer, as it is for any of us, is you get charged with a crime in court. And, and you have to face a jury of your peers, of your peers, peers being your fellow American citizens. Civilians, who, which, by the way, during jury selection, if you are an active duty officer, if you're a former officer, heck, if you're even related to an officer, you're probably not going to get to serve on that jury. They're going to specifically filter it to get law enforcement people off the jury. Oh, so, yeah. uh, you know, that, that whole idea, you can't comment unless you have a job. Um it's not war in the streets, man. This but isn't the opening scene of Predator right. Two. People, I mean, people aren't 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 setting up blockades and hiding behind them with M16s. And they're, they're, this is not urban warfare. It's they're, not Fallujah. Okay? And and by the way, our approach in Fallujah didn't work out that well. So why are we trying to bring it home to Grand Forks or to Minot or to Fargo or any of these other communities? I and when he talks like that, I just don't. I'm on the streets. In these communities, we all are. Is that how you feel? Do you really feel? I mean, we all know that crime happens, and we know that there's bad people out there, and murders happen, and um, thefts happen, and assaults happen, and rapes happen. There's there's terrible people out there. I don't doubt that, but the idea that our streets are a battlefield is thinking is 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 thinking that is not connected to reality. That, it's it sounds very apocalyptic. It's it's very fear-inducing. It sounds paranoid to me, and it's I guess last year, notwithstanding, having traveled uh, this fair country to many of our biggest cities—New York, Minneapolis, Dallas, Seattle, Denver, L.A., San Francisco—I've never felt as though there was war in our streets and terror lurking around every corner. I've engaged with many world travelers on the good talk and through my years of podcasting, I've had the opportunity to uh, just interview a lot of incredible people, Olympians, scientists, you name it. And, and among our topics, when we discuss travel is safety. Do you feel safe traveling to the cities in, in America or abroad? And, uh, to a person, all of them felt like they were safe. And yes, a measure of that safety is granted to us by the people who are wearing a badge, by police. Uh, I think that it's us also our safety is granted to us by how much um, violence has become mitigated in the modern era because of technology. Yeah. Uh, there is less. There is there is statistically less violence now than there ever has been. That's that's but, a good point because I want to I want to bring this up from Sarah in the chat room. She says, "But I would also hate to be a police officer. I think this country is so violent." that many of them are constantly operating under a feeling of fear and are therefore trigger happy 
particularly in some neighborhoods where violent things and shootings happen daily. And they should be half scared because people are crazy and they attack and kill cops all the time. For critics, tell me you'd be a cool cucumber in that constant state of threat. I, I do think that that is something that when, when you're looking at the actions of a police officer in a given situation, you do have to consider that we're all watching the video or reviewing the facts uh, from the safety of our living rooms or for the safety of our offices. Uh, we have all the time in the world to, to think about it. Uh, there's no life and death that, you know, your safety doesn't hinge on it. Other people's safety. That's how we view. We have the benefit of 2020 hindsight they're doing it in the moment. Now, that doesn't obviously excuse, you know, people doing wrong things. But there's also this idea where people are saying, well, the, the country is so violent right now. It's not. Um, you know, not. If, the, if, the, you, the if you look at the trend line, don't back that up. if you now, look at the trend 20, line, 20, we're, we're, 20, we're in one of the most the peaceful times. In the, we're, well, yeah, but we're in one of the, the, the uh, well, 2020 statistics are going to be weird because yes. the pandemic and it's just across the board going to be weird. I was looking up drunk driving statistics and it's like, well, the 2020 numbers, I don't even know what you do with them. I mean, I think you just have to put an asterisk by them and they it, are what they it are. Is, it is an asterisk year, but I, I, so just looking at the numbers and, and um, discussing what, what Sarah's brought up, brought up here, um, certainly cops are under pressure and, and uh, I, I do not want to um, – really undermine or undervalue in any way, shape, or form the dangers they face on their job. But this is not constant war and terror in our streets. And in, in, according to the FBI, um, 89 law enforcement officers were killed in the line of duty in 2019. Now, any number above zero is too many, um, but, but 89 law enforcement officers killed in a single year, um, that's – out of, out, of, out of a total law enforcement sort force that that numbers in the millions uh, I think it's I think it's like half a million or something Is like, it? Uh, depending okay. on yeah I was looking uh, maybe so like depending on how million. you're how you're uh, defining law if, enforcement. yeah and if you I think if you get into like like ATF and you get into like BCI and you get into HP you can probably get that number but pure park, police, park rangers think, game wardens stuff like right that. I think if you I think it's about half a million to 600,000 and so again any number above zero is too many but in just in looking at the numbers that is not a number that 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 look that I see and I'm like wow you know cops are dying in our streets every day um, that just the numbers don't back up that yeah. claim. And I, but I, I think I think part of it too is our is our news media, right? Where we're local. It's very easy for. I mean, once upon a time, like like a a, a local incident of a of an officer dying in the line of duty or, or something like that, it wouldn't be elevated to national stature unless um, you know a producer at like a national TV show or the editor at a national news publication chose to elevate it, chose to, to reach down and pick that story up and maybe connect the dots to stories in other parts of the country. That's how it became national news. Now it just needs to trend on Twitter. We can just do it, right? There's no gatekeeper. And so no. I, I, don't, I, I think sometimes that creates false perceptions where we hear about a thing more, so we assume it's happening more, but that's not necessarily the case. So in looking at some of these scenarios, Rob, in which now we, we know there's there's a there's an abundance of evidence um, suggesting that many of these um, negative and, and violent interactions occur. People are being killed over very trivial crimes. If there were perhaps a, f a few of these low level minor crimes that we could just get rid of that might that might help deescalate and, and defuse some of these situations. Are there any that jump out to you? Things that could de-escalate or defuse the situations, you know, I um, uh, just uh, laws that if, if they weren't yeah. on the books, I know we, we said there's too many sure. laws. So there's too many of these opportunities for police to have these negative interactions. Uh, how, what 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 well, are I don't know. Just any any thoughts on some on what some of those laws are that, that, hey, we don't we don't really need this. Yeah, I, it's I think it's hard to just say, well, if we did this one thing. Everything would be better because it's complex. I think anything. It's not one thing. It's right, not one yes. thing. To me, it's more. It's more the philosophy. We've got to change the philosophy in law enforcement. Where, a, you're not the military. You're not soldiers. You're not warriors. You're not at war. The community you're patrolling is not Fallujah. And and two, I think it's maybe we got to be. We want law enforcement to be less. Let's find reasons to arrest people or, or even let's find reasons to write people a ticket. It's public policy should be more organized around 
how do we just keep people safe? And, and one example of that, and I, I don't know how relevant maybe it is to the the uh, the debate about police brutality, but but North, I just I just wrote a column about it published earlier this morning, uh, and it's a it's a program, kind of a pilot program that North Dakota's Department of Transportation has been running under under Governor Burgum's administration. It's called Sober Ride. And essentially they got a they got a I think it was like a ten thousand dollar grant from the AAA Foundation. And for that, they essentially paid for ten dollar vouchers on the the rideshare service lift. Um and it was just it was just a code you could put in. It worked between five PM and two AM. You put the code in your phone when you called for your ride, you got ten dollars off your ride. Um they did 800 rides, $8,000 essentially worth of, of rides in the month of March. Now, if you think about it, that's 800 presumably uh, drunk, drunk people so taken off of our roads. Or, 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 or in, you know, in, impaired in some way in, drivers sure. um, who are off the road. Is that not a win? Is that not I what like we it. want? I yeah. like it. That sounds like but, a win. Now, now, the problem is, is, is the reaction I get to that from a lot of people is – well, we're just enabling drunks or we're just subsidizing people's drinking habits or partying habits or whatever. And and to my mind, I'm thinking, listen, they're going to do this. This is this is part of our culture. This is and you can have that debate, you know, get together with your church congregation or your civic group or something. You could talk about how people start a new temperance movement, whatever you want to do. You can do that. But in terms of public policy, I am for the sort of policy that we can make our community safer. And if we can do it without having to put people into the criminal justice system, that's even better. Because think of all the Way money better. we're saving if we're not sending somebody to court and the officer doesn't have to show up to be a witness at the court and they don't have to show up to be a witness at the DOT hearing about your driving privileges. And, you know, you don't have to have a judge putting this on his schedule and all. just think of all the money we're saving. By just in administrative fees and not tying up the time of our officers, you're saving a lot of money. And that's not to that's not to take into account the implications of of that person who got a ride home instead of risking a DUI that can for many people that can put your professional career in jeopardy. So, you know, you're certainly undermining that person's potential to be a great tax paying citizen um, coming back to. So I, I like it. That's that's a solution, Rob. And we need to find more of these solutions that that I think diminish the need for an interaction between um, police and our citizens, at least uh, that, that diminish the interactions, that the, the negative interactions, give cops more time to actually help people. So in looking at the, the, the data in 2019. More than 1,000 civilians were killed by police. As we just said, uh, only 48 officers were killed in the line of duty. So even though violent crime and property crime were down, police killings of civilians went up. And, and, and that is, again, what really – like I can't hammer that strongly enough. The, the, the crime that is really the crime that we should be afraid of as people, kidnapping, rape – violent murder, burglarizing of your house, kidnapping, all, any of this, those are all down. All those numbers have been have been on a complete downward spiral since since the mid 90s. It is technically again 20 maybe 2020 notwithstanding, there's never been a safer time to be alive in the United States yeah. of America. Which is right which now. is funny cuz I remember growing up playing playing Doom and violent video games and growing up in the age of internet porn and we were all supposed to be sociopathic murderous rapists by now and yet somehow right. somehow violent crime is is down but you know i one one part of the solution too jonah is we want we want good people to want to be cops right because yeah. i i think i think there are i think there are some people who go into law enforcement and i don't think it's by any stretch of the imagination the majority but there are some who go there because they like lording it over other people they like yeah. the power trip. They like the power it gives them. And we don't want those people in law enforcement. We want better people. But how do you attract it? This is a point Joe makes from the chat room. He says, further restricting the police to engage in force to protect themselves from public interactions will decrease recruitment numbers. When do we address the ret retraining of the public? Society is becoming more aggressive, outspoken, and belligerent. Now, I don't I don't agree with... with, with um, he continues, the cops are being required to scale back and tone down their tactics. Will society also be held to this higher standard and how can police be assured of it? Um, I think he's got that. I, I think there is a fair point in there, which is 
are good people going to want to be cops right now in this environment? I, 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 I don't know. That said, he does make some fair assertions, and I don't, I don't want to reduce necessarily the police ability to be cops, but I want to reduce their interactions with civilians over low-level offenses that pose no threat to public safety. Yeah, that's that's what I want to see. That's a step. In I think the right that's direction. something we could do for. Do you think cop, people get? I mean, even good people get into policing because they want to write tickets for jaywalking. No, or go hassle no, people about where they're smoking. Right. right or 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 to to take a bike from some kid that's riding it through the wrong neighborhood or to just or to just do write DUI tickets all night i mean i think they would rather i i think cops would like to help people they'd like to respond if somebody's having a trouble in their home and and maybe it's a screaming fight they'd go in there and settle people down and if somebody's being violent or has done something violent you know maybe that person needs to get arrested so the rest of the family can be protected i mean i think that's the sort of work police officers want to do they want to protect buildings from being robbed if people rob the building they want to catch them and put them in jail i think that's what good cops want to do but a lot of times we have good cops doing stupid things and they get frustrated and the community gets frustrated and that's a big big area where i think we could really i think we could do cops a favor i think we could do the communities that cops police a favor uh and everybody could just be happier yeah, that that's the step in the right direction that that we need, and 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 again, I hope that Derek Chauvin is a turning point, Rob. Uh, for for a lot of people, we've been we've been seeing this these things happen time and again on our headlines, dating from for in my era, dating back to Rodney King. I I, I really. I thought society would be better by now. There there is a real problem here, and and it's we all want it to go away. Not and not 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 go away like sweep it under the rug, right? We want this to get better. We want to heal. We want this wound to heal, and then we and 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 it just seems like different segments want to politicize these things and they want to keep picking that wound off. They want to they want to pick that scab off, right? And and it, and it keeps happening, and it's got to stop. We're we're just we we kill our citizens at an alarming rate more than any other country on this planet, and and and. and well, we've got to, well, we've got to identify yeah, our symptoms. Be but, careful. I mean, well, uh, yeah, okay. I mean, I mean, because if if uh, you know, if if some uh, I, I don't know Iran or something is killing. I mean, China's got right. two million people in a concentration camp. So let's be right. careful with I some said, of the I comparison. I said civilized country because that wouldn't be civilized if you're keeping people well, in concentration camps. Well, they're the, like the largest camps. economy on earth. One of the second. <laughs> right. I mean, I, it's hard. I mean, how do you call China not civilized? They're pretty sophisticated. You're, um, yes, they are. But they are also an awful, awful, brutal regime. But there is there is some but barbarism. I, I, still I, but also not this. minimizing what's going on in the United States. I mean, we talk about like incarceration rates where we're, we're rivaling places like China. And again, it's hard to take for granted to the, the statistics that they report, because is the communist regime going to be honest about police brutality? No. I mean, that's one of the by the way, I, I think people who want to be critical of the United States, you need to remember that a lot of times what makes the United States look bad is that in a lot of ways, we are very transparent about this stuff. And we do have an open press that can talk about this stuff. And we do have free speech rights so that if an NBA player, this is kind of the sad thing, an NBA player in the United States feels more comfortable criticizing their own government than they do risking their shoe contracts criticizing China. That's 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 a a sad reality in our, our culture right now. Um, it is, and it's it's a, it's a scary thought. And I do know, I know, in, in in many other countries too, we take for granted sort of this innocent until proven guilty. And this is cycling back to, to kind of what we talked about at the top of the show. In in the in the public arena, so many would be or alleged criminals are now guilty until proven innocent. In many other judicial systems across the planet, that is how it works. You have to prove your innocence. They don't have to prove your guilt. It's the other way around. So. Um, I, I don't see that changing in our system at all, but the public perception certainly uh, it, it 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 weighs heavily on these big cases. Yeah, I would I would still uh, rather be if I'm going to get charged with a crime, I'd rather it happen in the United States than a lot of other places in the world. Um, oh, undoubtedly. Uh, for for all our flaws in our system, it's uh, it's still one of the best in the world. It's just it's th- none of this stuff 
is uh, is easy. And I love this country, and I love cops. And uh, cops, I if, if anybody who's listening to this, I, I want you to be able to do your jobs. And I want you to be able to focus on real, actual policing and not a bunch of nonsense that the politicians get up to because they want more revenue or they're – they're on some social campaign or something, and uh, and and I want you to not have to feel like you're a soldier in your own community anymore, um, uh, like like you're occupying your own community. Let's let's do something better. Let's be neighbors and let's be friends and let's focus on how can we make our communities safe and hold the bad guys accountable, and uh, and that's that. So Jonah, any final thoughts? Final. Th- thoughts rob really come back to me for that that accountability factor i i i want to see more more cops willing to hold their fellow brothers and sisters in blue accountable for their negative actions no differently than i would hold my friend or my children or my coworkers or any other person in my life when i see you doing something negative bad terrible evil i'm i'm going to call you out on that i'm not I can't hide that for you. And and we shouldn't we shouldn't be doing that in the line of duty with the boys and girls in blue. It's got to stop. I agree. Jonah, thanks. Thanks, Rob.